Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Load Pull. In this short presentation, we'll explain the fundamental concepts behind load pull, the different types of load pull, how load pull testing is performed, and load pull measurement results. This presentation assumes a basic understanding of VISWAR, S parameters, and the Smith chart. If you're unfamiliar with these topics, or if you'd like a brief review, you might want to watch the presentations Understanding VISWAR and Return Loss, Understanding S parameters, and or Understanding the Smith chart before continuing with this presentation. This presentation is divided into four sections. In the first, we'll explain what load pull is and why it's used. We'll then introduce the two types of load pull testing and the instruments used to make load pull measurements. Tuners are a critical component in load pull testing, so we'll also spend some time discussing the different kinds of tuners. And in the final section, we'll show how load pull measurement results are used and displayed. In the radio frequency world, the standard load impedance is usually 50 ohms. As you should already know, maximum power transfer occurs when the source and load impedances are matched. Impedance mismatches cause reflections and are generally undesirable because they can reduce transfer power, create distortion and thermal issues, etc. So-called matching networks are therefore necessary in some cases. Scattering, or S parameters, can be used to characterize a device under test, but these parameters are only useful when the DUT is being operated into a matched load, or when the DUT is operating at relatively low power. This is often called small signal conditions. This in turn means that S parameters are only used when the DUT is operating in its linear region, where there are no significant harmonics or intermodulation products. There are, however, numerous common RF devices, such as power amplifiers, or PAs, that are designed and operated as nonlinear devices. For example, a PA is often designed to operate in compression in order to obtain maximum output power. Since these are large signal conditions, S parameters cannot be used to characterize these devices. In addition, the impedances involved may not necessarily all be 50 ohms. The input and output impedances of a power amplifier are typically quite low, 10 ohms or less, and thus matching networks are often required to interface with 50 ohm devices. Device performance, in terms of things such as output power, gain, power added efficiency, etc., will also vary as a function of both the input, or drive power, and the load impedance. Therefore, one fundamental question is, how do we determine the optimal load impedance under large signal conditions? And how does performance change as the load impedance changes? These questions can be answered using something called load pull. In load pull, a tuner is placed at the dot output to pull the load impedance away from the standard 50 ohm load. This allows measurements to be made under unmatched and large signal or nonlinear conditions. In some cases, a tuner may also be placed at the dot input to ensure a 50 ohm impedance match at the input or for making so-called source pull measurements. The first step in load pull measurements is specifying a range of impedance values. This is often defined as a region on the Smith chart. Next, tuners are used to change the impedance seen by the dot and measure the parameters of interest, such as output power, PAE, gain, etc. In some cases, we want to repeat this at different power levels, frequencies, bias levels, etc. The results of these measurements are then plotted on a Smith chart and or used to create a model of the DUT. We'll spend the remainder of this presentation covering each of these topics in more detail. Let's start by talking about the two different types of load pull testing. The first of these is scalar load pull, which is performed primarily using scalar RF power sensors. The second is vector load pull, which is performed primarily using vector network analyzers. We'll begin by looking at scalar load pull. In scalar load pull, power is measured using standard RF power sensors. These are scalar measurements because they do not include any phase information. Standard RF power sensors are also not frequency selective instruments, so they measure all power within their bandwidth, including harmonics, intermodulation products, etc. It is, however, possible to add a spectrum analyzer to the test setup in order to view and measure harmonics and intermod products individually. 
Scalar load pull is performed using passive impedance tuners that must be characterized before use in order to de-embed them. We'll discuss the different types of tuners later in this presentation. Other components and cables must also be calibrated out before testing. Let's walk graphically through a scalar load pull test setup. Tuners are connected to both sides of the device under test, and a signal generator creates the input signal. Power sensors are used to measure both the input and output power. Optionally, a spectrum analyzer may also be added to the test setup in order to make frequency selective measurements, such as measuring individual harmonics or intermod products. Vector load pull has largely replaced scalar load pull. Since vector load pull involves measuring vector quantities, a vector network analyzer is used to make measurements of both the incident and reflected waves. Note that this is done by connecting to the VNA's direct receiver access rather than to the standard VNA connectors. Full to port calibration is used for de-embedding, that is, for removing the effect of connectors, cables, etc. Vector load pull is the most accurate type of load pull. Unlike scalar load pull, it does not require tuner pre-calibration and is not dependent on the repeatability of the tuner. It can also make measurements in real time and allows measurements of harmonics without the need for a separate spectrum analyzer. A vector network analyzer is the core of a vector load pull test setup. As before, tuners are connected to the DUT. The stimulus signal is provided by the VNA and is terminated into a matched load. Low loss couplers at the DUT input and output are then connected to the direct receiver inputs of our VNA. In addition to providing more accurate results, vector load pull has a significantly less complicated test configuration and uses fewer instruments than scalar load pull. As we've just seen, in both scalar and vector load pull, tuners are used to change or pull the load impedance. That is, they change the value of the reflection coefficient, gamma. The most important specification for a tuner is its tuning or matching range. In other words, what is the range of complex impedances that can be created by the tuner? In many cases, this range of tunable impedances is represented as a region on the Smith chart, as shown here. Other important specifications for tuners include things such as the supported frequency and power ranges, how quickly the tuner can change the impedance, the accuracy of the created impedances, etc. Although tuners are indispensable for load pull testing, they can also be used for non-load pull applications. One example of this is robustness testing, in which we test the ability of a device to tolerate high levels of reflected power created by a mismatched load. The tuners used in load pull can be grouped into three main categories, passive tuners, active tuners, and hybrid tuners. Let's start by looking at passive tuners. Passive mechanical tuners are the most fundamental way to implement load pull. They create a complex impedance using a line or carriage and a probe or slug that can be moved in both the X and Y directions. When the probe is fully retracted, the tuner has the minimum effect on the signal passing through it. Lowering the probe creates reflections and changes the amplitude response. Moving the probe along the line changes the phase of the reflection. Therefore, by moving the probe in these two directions, passive tuners can create almost any desired impedance value on the Smith chart. Passive tuners have a number of advantages. They're low cost, relatively simple and robust, and they also usually support a wide range of input powers and a wide range of frequencies. One disadvantage of passive tuners is their relatively slow tuning time. Even though probe motion can be automated, adjustment is still a mechanical process. Another disadvantage of tuners is that even in the fully retracted position, they introduce some amount of loss, and this in turn can limit the range of impedances that can be tuned. Let's look at this in a little more detail. When using a passive tuner, the signal reflected or returned from the tuner will always be smaller than the forward signal because the line and the tuner will always introduce some loss. This loss effectively reduces or shrinks the tunable area of the Smith chart. Another way of saying this 
is that the reflection coefficient gamma will always be less than 1. Therefore, passive tuners may not be able to create the desired impedances, especially when these impedances lie near the edge of the Smith chart, where gamma equals 1. Recall that some devices, such as power amplifiers, require low impedances for optimal performance. This limitation in tuning area can, however, be overcome using active tuners. In an active tuner, the forward wave is typically absorbed into a non-reactive load, and the reflected wave is created using a signal generator with controllable phase and amplitude. This signal is then returned to the DUT through a feedback amplifier. By controlling both the phase and the amplitude of the return signal, an active tuner can simulate any degree of mismatch and thus create any desired impedance or gamma value on the Smith chart, including values of gamma that are greater than 1. It might be helpful at this point to compare the tuning ranges of passive and active tuners. Recall that with passive tuners, attenuation, or loss, reduces the tunable area, potentially making it difficult to create impedances that lie near the edge of the Smith chart, where the reflection coefficient gamma is equal to 1. An active tuner, on the other hand, can create impedances at any point on the Smith chart, and can even create impedances that lie outside the Smith chart, that is, values of gamma that are greater than 1. Let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of active tuners, in particular how they compare to passive tuners. As we've just seen, the biggest advantage of an active tuner is that it can create any impedance on the Smith chart, even values where the reflection coefficient gamma is greater than 1. The other major advantage of active tuners over passive tuners is that they are electronic, not mechanical, so tuning is much faster. Active tuners do, however, often have a narrower frequency range. Active tuners are also usually larger and higher cost. In particular, it can be difficult to create active tuners for higher powers and at higher frequencies. We mentioned earlier that the greatest disadvantage of passive tuners is limited tuning range. And although active tuners can overcome this limitation, the power requirements can be quite high, making construction of a purely active tuner difficult. A solution, therefore, is to combine active and passive tuners into a so-called hybrid or hybrid active tuner. This provides much higher flexibility, but has somewhat higher costs and complexity. In a hybrid tuner, the passive tuner acts as a type of pre-match, with the active tuner then providing the remainder of the needed impedance change. This combination of passive and active tuning reduces the power requirements in a hybrid tuner compared to a purely active tuner. So far, we've only been discussing the impedance presented to the fundamental frequency. Recall that load pull is concerned with large signal nonlinear behavior that can create significant harmonic distortion. The impedance seen by each harmonic becomes more important as the dot goes further into compression and harmonic amplitude increases. Load pull measurements, therefore, often also consider the second and third harmonics in addition to the fundamental. Note that the optimum impedances for the fundamental and harmonics are usually not the same. The reason we're concerned with this is the impedance seen by different harmonics can have an important impact on device operation. For example, power added efficiency is often significantly impacted by the choice of these harmonic impedances. Therefore, in load pull, we often need to have a way to tune the impedance independently for each harmonic. Harmonic tuning can be done with either passive or active tuners. One way of performing harmonic tuning with passive tuners is to use multiple tuners connected via a triplexer. Another method is cascading multiple tuners together. A third way is to use a multi-carriage tuner to control or define each of the individual impedances. When using active tuners for harmonic tuning, one common approach is using a passive tuner for the fundamental and active tuners for the harmonics. This is because the fundamental will have a higher power requirement than the higher order harmonics. Alternatively, active tuners may also be used for the fundamental as well. And although not shown here, hybrid tuners are also sometimes used to provide harmonic tuning. 
Now that we've covered tuning, let's spend the remainder of this presentation discussing load pull measurement results. As we know, load pull is the process by which we measure one or more device values or parameters at different impedances. Typical measured values are parameters such as power added efficiency, output power, gain, etc. Since we're measuring these as a function of impedance, measured values are often plotted on the Smith chart with points of identical or similar performance connected together to create a contour. In this example, this contour represents a power added efficiency of 65%. This contour connects impedance values that yield a PAE of 64%. This contour represents 63%, etc. Contours enable us to visualize measured values as a function of complex impedance and determine the optimal impedances for a given parameter. Here, the best power added efficiency is achieved at the impedance located at the center of these contours. The optimal impedance is often different for different parameters. For example, the best PAE may be achieved at this impedance, whereas the highest output power might occur at a different impedance. The question then becomes, which impedance should be used? Using load pull data, the designer can choose either the value that optimizes one of these parameters, or choose a value that represents a compromise between parameters. For example, if a design requires both a certain minimum output power and a certain minimum power added efficiency, the designer could use the contour data to identify which region of the Smith chart, here the purple shaded area, would be able to meet both of these requirements. Measured contour data is used primarily in the design of matching networks, since this allows easy visualization of the optimal impedances for measured parameters. Another use of load pull data is to create a large signal non 50 ohm model of the device under test. Two types of models can be derived from load pull data. A compact model is a small signal model in which the dot is represented in the forms of R, L, and C components, voltage dependent current sources, and current dependent voltage sources. A behavioral model, on the other hand, is a large signal model which takes harmonics and distortion into account. One of the more popular behavioral models, the Cardiff Model Plus, fits polynomial curves to the measured data. Behavioral models are often called polyharmonic distortion or PHD models, although you may occasionally hear these referred to as X parameters as well. Once a model has been created from load pull data, it can easily be imported into and used within RF design tools such as Microwave Office. Let's end with a brief summary of what we've covered. Not all RF devices operate in small signal or 50 ohm matched environments, power amplifiers being a very common example. Device parameters such as output power or power added efficiency are however often a function of the load impedance, so it's important to be able to characterize devices operating into non-matched loads. Load pull uses tuners to change the load impedance for testing. These tuners may be passive, active, or hybrid devices, and it may also be necessary to use tuners that can define the individual harmonic impedances as well. Scalar load pull is performed using RF power sensors, but most load pull testing is vector load pull, which uses a vector network analyzer, or VNA, for generating and measuring signals. Load pull measurement results are used in two main ways. One is plotting constant performance contours on a Smith chart, and the other is creating models for use in simulation and design. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Load Pull. If you'd like to learn more about Load Pull or the instruments and accessories used in load pull testing, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.